One day, he showed me an unsolicited letter he had pulled from a stack of fan mail. They were then getting thousands of letters and postcards each week. This letter was from a would-be screenwriter named Nicholas Himes, who lived in New York. It was a rambling but intelligent letter suggesting that their movie should be about them making a movie. Himes seemed to get Sonny and Cher, as well as understanding their audience appeal. He made shrewd observations as to what a film audience would want from them. Quote, Just be yourselves. Don't try to be actors. The audience loves Sonny and Cher and wants to see you as you are. Unquote. Sonny suggested we call Mr. Himes, whose phone number was listed at the bottom of his letter. Steve Broidy was wary of adding another non-professional to our club. Thinking we needed an old pro, Steve brought on board one of his cronies, a veteran producer of B-Pictures, Lindsley Parsons. Okay, but Sonny and I didn't want an old pro writer. It was the first of many battles Steve was to lose. He wanted to make a cheap picture, pick up a quick buck, and get out. We wanted to make our reputations, me as a filmmaker, Sonny as a movie star. We treated Broidy and Parsons like the medieval war horses we thought they were, but Sonny was always respectful, leaving it to me to voice our objections whenever a disagreement came up. Nick Himes was in his 20s. He was thin, smart, and angry. He tried to conceal his anger, but you could sense it in a crowd. He wore either a perpetual smirk or a scowl on his face, and his manner was unlike the tone of his letter. He was condescending to Sonny and disdainful of me. What he really wanted was to direct the picture himself, and he wondered how I had come up with this plum assignment. The three of us met every day for a couple of weeks, with Cher making an occasional disinterested appearance. She'd listen to a few minutes of our conversation and then ask Sonny when he was going to be done. He would say, soon, with a smile or a hug, and we'd go on talking for another four or five hours. Nick's idea to call the film The Sonny and Cher Movie and do it as a kind of documentary with music was good as far as it went but he hadn't worked out the details. The truth was, you couldn't really bring cameras into their house and show their actual relationship. Cher was an obviously gorgeous flower that had not yet bloomed. She was completely and voluntarily under Sonny's domination, but this wasn't an image you'd want to portray. Nick's idea was new wave and hip, but there was no meat on its bones. After two weeks of batting it around, I had a private meeting with him. He clearly didn't want to have this one-on-one, -on -one, and his attitude was sullen and morose. I told him that our meetings were going nowhere and that Broidy wanted to start the picture as soon as possible. Nick's response was that I just didn't understand his vision. The next day, Sonny got a long letter from Nick warning him about me. Quote, Friedkin's never directed a movie. Have you seen any of his documentaries? They're not great. Unquote. When Sonny read it to me, I said, Well, that tears it for me. Sonny could see I was stung by Nick's comments. Billy, I trust you 100%. You and I are joined at the hip. We're going to do this movie together, he said. I thanked Sonny for his support, but told him that Broidy and Parsons were getting restless. I know, Sonny agreed. Here's what I think we ought to do. Before we cut Nick loose, let me ask him for a treatment. His best shot, Sonny said. In due course, a three-page treatment arrived at the house. It was all sizzle. Nothing specific, just a restatement of Nick's philosophy about movies in general 
Sonny and Cher in particular. Sonny shrugged and said, he's got to go. A confrontation with Himes would be a waste of time, so Sonny just called him and thanked him. Without a screenplay, we couldn't prepare a budget, but Broidy said he wanted to make the film for no more than $500,000, including Sonny and Cher's fee of $100,000. We told Steve we'd write the script ourselves at no extra cost to him. Despite the fact that neither of us had written a screenplay, Steve said, all right, go ahead. He had no idea what to make of us, but he was committed now to making the movie. We worked around the clock and on weekends. Takeout dinner always came from the Villa Capri, a popular Italian restaurant in East Hollywood. We ate clam zuppa by the dozens, and whoever ate the least had to pay for the whole dinner. Occasionally, Cher would appear and listen to what we'd written. Her comments were restricted to one word. Okay, or really, or why, or ugh. Usually accompanied by a frown. Then she'd take off. She'd have no part of our clam zupa marathons, warning Sonny not to eat too much garlic bread. We tried to flesh out Nick Heim's idea of the movie being about Sonny and Cher making a movie. The film would be a Faustian tale about compromise. How much would Sonny and Cher sell out to make a stupid movie? That was the plot of our picture. Sonny came up with the structure, the gags, and all the good stuff and we wrote everything on yellow pads. The film would show our heroes being courted by a Mephistophelian film producer called Mordecus, who only wanted to cash in on their celebrity. Cher in the script, like Cher in real life, was against the whole process. But Sonny was gung-ho, and their arguments eventually caused a breakup, followed by a reconciliation and a happy ending, of course. The script portrayed their fantasies of the kind of films they liked to make, and these fantasies were satires of the private eye genre, a Tarzan movie, and a Western. Each film within the film would be a short comedic sequence and include a new song from Sonny and Cher. As in real life, Sonny and Cher were up against a deadline to start making this picture. Steve wanted to call the movie I Got You, Babe, but Sonny came up with a title from a new song he was working on called Good Times. We finished the script on a Friday night. The following Monday, we were supposed to start pre-production, which involved set design, casting, hiring a crew, and location scouting. On Saturday morning, Sonny and I read the pages to his entourage, who were suitably impressed. Even Cher smiled a few times. Sonny asked if anyone else could type, and since there were no volunteers, he found a script typing service in the yellow pages. About three hours later, a pleasant young woman arrived with a portable typewriter, awestruck to be meeting Sonny. He set her up at a kitchen table, and we went into the den to watch a football game and hang out. We had another clam zupa eating contest. Late afternoon became early evening. We had forgotten about the typist. At about 7.45, Sonny looked at his watch. How many pages did we give her, he asked. I think about 80, I said, no less than 80. How long should it take to type 80 pages, Sonny wondered as he looked around the room. Harvey Kresge spoke up. What, three hours? Then Sonny said, what time did she get here? Around noon, I think, I said. Blank stares all around. I wonder if she's hungry, Sonny said, and went to the kitchen with a container of clam zuppa. About five minutes later, he came back to the den 
with a two-inch stack of paper and a wistful smile on his face. Behind him, I noticed the typist going out the front door, her portable in tow. She seemed upset. You're not going to believe this, Sonny said, smiling, and handed me the pages. I started to read, shaking my head in astonishment. What's wrong? Harvey asked. I skimmed the pages, then set them down slowly. She typed herself into this script, I said. What? She took what we gave her and created her own screenplay, focusing on the story of a typist who comes to work for Sonny and Cher and stays on to become their manager. I guess that lets you out, I said to Joe DiCarlo. No shit, Joe said, laughing. We heard the screech of brakes as the typist's car pulled out of the driveway. What did you say when you saw this, I asked Sonny. He was still smiling. I thanked her and told her we wouldn't need her anymore, he said, as though this sort of thing happened every day. And I let her keep the clam zupa. <laughs> when the budget came in at $800,000, Sonny and I had to listen to Broidy scream for an hour. This picture should be made for five hundred grand. We used to make pictures at Allied Artists for two or three hundred. We'd shoot them in a week with great directors and big-name actors. Steve was right, of course, but I wished I had accepted Frankenheimer's offer. It was Sonny's optimism, his belief in what he created, and, of course, Abe Lasfogel's skills in the art of persuasion that calmed matters down. We went ahead with an $800,000 budget. But Broidy pre-sold the rights to Columbia Pictures for $1.2 million before we even made the film. This shrewd old bastard knew what he was doing. Lynn Parsons brought potential crew members to the Paramount lot where we had rented a soundstage. The meetings were with, quote, old pros, unquote, like Bob Wyckoff, who had worked with Parsons before and he became our director of photography. Mel Shapiro, who I had worked with briefly at Walper, was hired as the film editor, and to his credit, Lynn brought in David Salvin to be my assistant director. Dave had a great sense of humor and worked on at least 50 films. He knew the game and played it better than anyone I've ever met. His father was Cecil B. DeMille's assistant director, and Dave's education was on DeMille's sets. Dave and I became close friends, and he was like the older brother I never had. A legendary Academy Award-winning character actor, George Saunders, agreed to play the evil producer Mordecus. I was shocked when he accepted, but I looked forward to working with him, with trepidation. He had given so many fine performances, and he won his Academy Award in one of my favorite films, All About Eve. Why would he take this role in a low-budget, under-the-radar movie starring two non-actors and with an inexperienced director? I soon learned that many well-known actors, no matter how distinguished, had personal demons and financial problems. Mr. Saunders did what I asked of him, accepted corrections, was suitably malevolent, and left without a word at the end of the day. We also shot scenes on location around Los Angeles. If you drive due north of Paramount Pictures for less than two miles, you pass a modest residential area before you come to Bronson Canyon, a large, undeveloped tract that looks like the Old West, where hundreds of B-Westerns had been shot. We went up to Bronson Canyon to make one shot of Sonny riding across a hilltop on a beat-up old sway-backed horse for our Western parody. I told Bob Wyckoff I wanted this to be a silhouette, 
and we should shoot at the end of the day, not before 6 p.m. This was literally one shot with a single camera. To my surprise, the crew was called to the location at noon, making it impossible to do any other studio work that day. When I arrived at the location, I saw a bank of 12 enormous theatrical lights called Brutes pointed at the hilltop. There was a crew of at least 60 people gathered around the catering truck. I went up to Wyckoff, who, with his electricians, was carefully adjusting every light as though he was lighting the Parthenon. I said, Bob, what the hell are all these lights? I told you I wanted a silhouette. Yeah, I know, he answered grumpily, staring at his shoes. I gotta use these guys, Billy. I'll give you a silhouette. I'll expose for it, but I have to use all this equipment. Salvin explained that it was a case of, quote, back-scratching, unquote. The cameraman who employed the most crew members got the best crews. Bob was feathering his nest at great expense to management. This shot, this single shot, was one of our most expensive days. Massive trucks, gigantic lights, an enormous crew, and the shot lasted 10 seconds on the screen. Bob Wyckoff was a competent director of photography. I would describe how I wanted each shot to look, and he would invariably overlight it. He was a by-the-book guy with no imagination. I was the youngest guy on the set and the least experienced. I had gotten to this place too soon, but I learned that before you could accomplish anything creatively, you had to be able to manage a crew, win their respect, get everyone on the same page and on your side, and most important, vet the crew thoroughly before hiring them. When it came to the end of our 20-day shoot at Paramount, we had 45 minutes of usable film and a lot left to shoot, including three more songs. Steve Broidy was apoplectic. Sonny was philosophic. He and I had become like brothers and could laugh at our problems. Out of adversity, I came up with a backup plan. I would bring Bill Butler, my cameraman from Chicago, to Los Angeles, pick up a small non-union crew, and go to various locations without permits to complete the shoot for very little added expense, less than $100,000. When I presented my plan to Steve, he became almost incoherent. What the hell was I thinking? But he thought the film we shot had promise. He decided to take a chance and let me finish the film under the radar. Butler came out to Los Angeles and we put him up at the Sunset Marquee. I screened the footage we had for him and introduced him to Sonny and Cher. Then Sonny, Dave Salvin, Butler, and I worked out a plan to shoot roughly half the film guerrilla style. We drove around the city, from Malibu to downtown L.A., shooting what were essentially music videos way before their time. It was good to work with Bill again, and we accomplished more in a day than in three days with a full union crew. One Saturday morning, we all piled into a station wagon. Our small crew and equipment followed in another wagon. I drove the lead car and we pulled up to the Paramount Pictures' main gate. There was one guard on duty, who we all knew. I rolled down my window and said, Sonny and Cher, pointing to them. And the guard, of course, smiled and recognized them. He knew we had offices on the lot and had filmed there, but he didn't realize that we'd shut down the week before. He never questioned why we were driving onto the lot unannounced and with another vehicle behind us. Are we just going to make some publicity shots, I explained. He smiled again, nodded, and waved us through. Just beyond the main gate was a permanent western street 
used regularly for the hit television series Bonanza. In the station wagon, Sonny got into his cowboy costume, and we filmed him on the Bonanza Street in a parody of Gary Cooper in High Noon. We filmed for about an hour, then shot additional footage around the lot with both Sonny and Cher, all improvised stuff. Everything was done with a handheld Aeroflex camera operated by Butler. When we finished, we drove to the main gate, thanked the guard, and laughed all the way to the next location. We filmed Sonny on his motorcycle on the San Diego freeway at night, also without a permit. We filmed around the new music center, still under construction in downtown Los Angeles. We filmed in the Malibu Hills and on the Sunset Strip. The city was ours, and the plan was to shoot quickly, get in and get out, before passers-by or police officers knew what was happening. In less than two weeks, we had our additional 45 minutes. I felt good about the film. I began to think it might just work. In the course of his career as a songwriter, singer, and producer, Sonny, along with Cher, sold over 80 million records and had many top 10 singles. Though he could neither read nor write a note of music, when he heard a melody in his head, he would call his arranger, Harold Batiste Jr., to come over. Sonny would hum the different parts to him, melodies, counterpoint, rhythm. Harold would transcribe Sonny's humming into notes on paper, laying out lead lines for the various sections. Sonny would say, I need about eight strings, two percussion, a piano, two trumpets, and a bass. Harold would book the musicians, known as the Wrecking Crew, which often included Carol Kay, David Bromberg, Dr. John, whose real name was Mac Rebenek, Glenn Campbell, and others who later became successful solo artists. Sonny would arrive at the Gold Star Studios, and if there were any changes that he wanted to make, he would hum them to Batiste, who would revise the music sheets. Then Sonny and Harold would go into the control room with the recording engineer Stan Ross. When Stan had preset his sound levels, Sonny would address the musicians over a loudspeaker from the control room. There was no conductor. He would just shout out, Okay, you guys, you ready? There were nods and waves. Then Sonny would say, One, two, three, hit it. Initially, it was all cacophony. Then he would start to sculpt the sound. He would say, trumpets, play softer. Guitars, take a break before the violins come in. Drums, do it like this. Ka-chung, ka-chung, ka-chuck, ka-chung. Ka-chung, ka-chung, ka-chuck, ka-chung. Okay? Batiste would quickly rewrite the various sections, and they'd start again. Sonny would tell Stan Ross, the recording engineer, I want to hear more violins, less brass, more echo on everything. Stan would readjust the levels, and Sonny would continue to sculpt the background track until he was ready to, quote, lay one down, unquote. It would sometimes take three days before he was satisfied. The background track seldom hinted at the melody or the lyrics of the song. When Sonny was satisfied with the orchestral mix and the musicians left, he would sit at a table in the studio with a brown paper bag that once held someone's lunch or any odd scrap of paper he could find. He'd borrow a pencil from Stan or Harold and write lyrics that seemed to be, like, dictated to him. This took about an hour. He'd make a few changes, then call Cher at home to tell her he'd be sending a car for her. When she arrived, Sonny would show her the lyrics and sing them for her. She'd start to sing, and Sonny would direct her, 
saying things like, add this word or emphasize that. Cher always said that as a singer, she was imitating Sonny. And Sonny told me he used to try to imitate Frankie Lane. When Cher felt comfortable, they'd go into a sound booth and wearing headphones to which they could hear the music track, they would sing together into a single microphone. Sonny didn't do more than two or three takes, and they were usually finished in about an hour. I remember hearing all the songs from Good Times being recorded this way, and then later, Bang Bang, Laugh at Me, The Beat Goes On, and other hits. I found the process to be amazing. A man trusting his instincts and believing in himself, open to inspiration. Stravinsky described the circumstances under which he wrote The Rite of Spring. He said, I am the vessel through which the Rite of Spring passed. Now, Sonny was no Stravinsky, but Stravinsky never sold 80 million records. In May of 1967, a week before the movie opened, there was a world premiere in Austin, Texas. We flew down on a private jet provided by Columbia Pictures, filled with what Alan Greenspan later called irrational exuberance. There was a parade from our hotel to the governor's mansion, where Governor John Connolly was to award Sonny and Cher the keys to the state. We rode in open cars to the domed Capitol building, Sonny and Cher in the lead car. We quickly got a sense of the fate that awaited our film. Along the entire parade route, about three miles, there were no more than a couple of hundred people waving at us with very little enthusiasm. There were a few photographers along the way, and some weren't even sure who the celebrities were. The theater, a large old movie palace, was less than half filled. There was a Sonny and Cher look-alike contest, sponsored by the film's local distributor, in which about a dozen couples dressed like Sonny and Cher, were paraded on and off the stage to the boos or cheers of the audience. The prize for the winning couple was to be a weekend at Sonny and Cher's house with a dynamic duo themselves. At the screening, the audience was restless. There were very few laughs, and the response when it was over was listless. On the plane ride home, we told ourselves that it seemed to go pretty well. And what do a bunch of hicks from Austin know anyway? In Chicago, at the first screening there, I took my dear mother, who is in good health and high spirits, still working as a nurse, to the premiere at the Chicago Theater. Of course, she loved it and was proud of me, and I promised to bring her to Los Angeles as soon as I could rent a house. I introduced her to Sonny and Cher, which was one of the highlights of her life and proof that her faith in me was justified. The film tanked. Ironically, the very thing it was about, selling out, is what we did while convincing ourselves we were doing it on our terms. Only Cher seemed to get what was happening. She continued to do everything Sonny and I asked of her, while never committing fully to the fiasco that was our film. She wanted to make a movie, but not this one. I've made better films than Good Times, thank God, but I've never had so much fun. As Sonny and Cher dropped in popularity, my star remarkably continued to rise. The film got good reviews from leading critics, and I was getting more offers. I continued to see Sonny and Cher, Joe DiCarlo, and Harvey Kresge as friends. Every Saturday night, we had a poker game at Sonny's house. One night, we were sitting around the kitchen table playing cards when the doorbell rang at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Joe DiCarlo got up, and motioned everyone to be quiet. 
He pulled a forty-five automatic from a holster concealed by his jacket and cautiously went to the front door. He was gone for two minutes when we heard him yell, Get the fuck out of here! Followed by the front door slamming and the sound of a car pulling away. Joe returned to the kitchen, holstering his forty-five, red-faced and angry. What the hell was that, Sonny asked. Ah, two assholes came up here in a taxi, said they won some fucking look-alike contest at the premiere in Austin, Joe explained. Everyone laughed, and we continued our poker game. But that was the final nail in the coffin of good times. In September of 1966, Fantosi said that Blake Edwards wanted to meet me. Blake was one of the hottest writer-producer-directors and one of the most talented men in Hollywood. He had made Days of Wine and Roses, the Pink Panther films, A Shot in the Dark, Breakfast at Tiffany's, The Great Race, and a lot of other important films. He had a television series on the air about a private detective entitled Peter Gunn, starring Craig Stevens, and featuring a great thumping bass score by Henry Mancini that became a foundation of rock and roll. Stevens' character, the epitome of cool, was modeled on Cary Grant. He always dressed impeccably and never got his hair mussed. His girlfriend, Edie, a nightclub singer played by Lola Albright, was a beautiful West Coast blonde. I met Blake for breakfast in his spacious bungalow on the Paramount lot. Blake had a permanent entourage that included his uncle, Owen Crump, who was his associate producer. I also met his set designer and decorator and a corps of assistants. Blake was a karate black belt. He was wiry, sandy-haired, muscular, and wore tinted glasses that shielded his eyes. He seemed troubled, and I wondered what personal demons afflicted a man who was so successful. But I admired his work, and I would have been intimidated had he not put me immediately at ease. He was flattering about good times and wondered if I had ever seen his television series, Peter Gunn. I told him it was my favorite show, which was true. I asked if he was planning to bring it back, and he said, Maybe, but I want to do it first as a feature film, and I was thinking, because I've got a lot on my plate right now, you might be the guy to direct it, with me producing. I was humbled, but exhilarated. I didn't know what to say, except, It would be an honor to work with you, Mr. Edwards. He said, I want to get going on it, but I have two problems. Have you got a little time? Sure, I said. You know the character of Edie, he asked me. Of course, I answered. She's played by Lola Albright. Well, that's one problem. I want to use Lola, but Bluedorn thinks she's too old. Bluedorn was Charlie Bluedorn, an Austrian billionaire who, with little capital and a shrewd business sense, cobbled together a bunch of small companies to form one of the biggest of the 1960s conglomerates, the Gulf and Western Corporation. He had recently acquired Paramount Pictures. Charlie loved movies and made it clear he would be a hands-on owner. He told Blake he wanted to show him a screen test that he, Bluedorn, had commissioned of an unknown actress to play Edie in the movie version of Peter Gunn. The test was directed by Otto Preminger, a well-known film director and a fellow Austrian, as a favor to Bluedorn. Blake asked me to watch the test with him. I was delighted. We walked to the editorial building to screening room 8, an antiquated chamber with no air, furnished with 40 old red velvet seats. A slate appeared on the screen, identifying the test and its director. 
And then, an attractive blonde woman appeared, wearing a tight blouse, tight pants, but with a thick German accent. The test was embarrassing. At one point, Blake shouted, Oh, my God. He asked me to accompany him to the office of the outgoing head of the studio, Howard Koch, a warm, likable man who was respected everywhere in Hollywood. President of the Motion Picture Academy at that time, he had produced films before and after he became a studio head. Howard was sympathetic to Blake's concerns. This woman can't act, Blake shouted. She has a German accent. Edie has to be an all-American girl. I can't understand a word she's saying. Bludorn won't greenlight the film unless she's in it, Howard reported sadly. You gotta be kidding. Blake was pissed off now. He must be fucking her. Howard smiled. Welcome to Hollywood, baby. Back in Blake's office, I joined him in lamenting what he had just seen. He was now storming around the room in front of his staff, yelling, Fuck Bluedorn. I'll take the picture to Warner Brothers. I own Peter Gunn, and I'm not going to let a Nazi play Edie. Stories about the casting couch are legendary in Hollywood, and early in my career, I discovered that sex between producers, directors, and actors was common. But I had heard of no one who ever got a leading role in a studio movie because of sexual favors. Stories about Marilyn Monroe early in her career have been widely reported, but she earned her way to stardom after a long apprenticeship. At my next breakfast with Blake, I reminded him that he told me he had two problems. What was the other one, I asked. The script, he said. I'd like to get your input. This was the first time anyone had actually given me a script that was going to be produced. Blake had evidently won his battle with Bluedorn because the Austrian woman was not going to play Edie. I brought the script back to my kitchenette at the Sunset Marquee and began to read it. It was entitled Gun by Blake Edwards. With each page, my depression increased. The story was thin and predictable. The characters were wooden. It had bomb written all over it. And after good times, I didn't think I could survive two in a row. Monday morning, I went to see Blake, and my breakfast tray was set up across from his. So, what do you think, he asked, munching on an English muffin. I chose my words carefully, but I had to say what I felt and accept the consequences. I said, Blake, I think this script is a piece of shit. He looked up in shock, his English muffin poised in midair. What? he said. He set the muffin down and looked at me directly, not so much mad as confused. What did you just say? A bitter smile crossed his lips. I said, I don't like it at all. It's like you took two old television scripts and just put them together. There's nothing new here. This is Peter Gunn light. Your worst enemy wouldn't write you a script this bad. His uncle Owen, who was standing in the back of the room near the door and who I had come to like, coughed slightly. There was another person sitting in a dark corner of the office. He didn't say anything, nor did Blake introduce us. Blake stood up and said, Why don't you tell us what you really think? I'm sorry, Blake, I said. I want to work with you, but not on this. I'd need to start from scratch. From scratch, he bellowed. What in the hell do you know? You're a punk kid with no credits, and you're telling me from scratch? We shook hands and I left. There's honesty and there's self-destruction. But I couldn't continue making films I didn't want to see.
even though my agents at the Morris office were now cautioning me, you're only a film director if you're making films. But I also recalled Lass Fogel's advice when we first met, never make a picture you don't believe in. I left Blake's office with mixed feelings and disappointment as I walked toward the Paramount parking lot. The lot was actually in an enormous tank, and the cars were cleared out whenever they needed to fill the tank with water and put a ship's model on it or have people swimming in it. It's where DeMille had filmed The Parting of the Red Sea. Before I reached the lot, I heard someone call out my name. I turned around and saw a tall, dark-skinned, dark-haired man coming toward me. I'm Bill Blatty, he said. We shook hands. We haven't met, he continued, but I was in Blake's office just now. Oh, right, the man in the corner who said nothing. I wrote the script, Blatty said. Really? I didn't see your name on it. He laughed. Blake does that sometimes. I was embarrassed. Look, I, I'm sorry if I... It's okay, he smiled. I know the script doesn't work. We all do. Everybody in Blake's company. Now I was really confused. Blatty continued. Blake's got a lot of things going on right now. Peter Gunn is old news to him. He just wants to get it made. It wasn't the image I had of Blake Edwards, but Blatty went on. You're the only one who's told him the truth, and I admire that, because I know it cost you the job. I thanked him, and we went our separate ways. During the time I worked at Walper, and for several years afterward, Dave used to invite me to screenings of new films at his house. One night I met Bud Yorkin, who with his partner Norman Lear, produced and directed some of television's most successful variety programs. The Colgate Comedy Hour with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, The George Goebel Show, specials with Fred Astaire and Perry Como. Later, they conquered the sitcom world with All in the Family, Maud, The Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, and others. They started to produce and direct films together. The first one being Neil Simon's Come Blow Your Horn with Frank Sinatra, then Never Too Late, followed by Divorce American Style with Dick Van Dyke. Bud was one of the best comedy variety directors in TV, and he became one of my biggest supporters. We liked each other instantly, and we've been close friends for 45 years. In 1967, at the newly formed United Artists Motion Picture Company, David Picker, the studio head, made a two-picture deal with Bud and Norman. The first was to be a zany comedy called Start the Revolution Without Me, starring Gene Wilder and Donald Sutherland. The second was the night they raided Minsky's. Bud wanted to go to France to direct Start the Revolution, and so he proposed that I direct Minsky's in New York with Norman producing. It was an extraordinary opportunity for me, a major studio musical comedy about the last days of burlesque. This is the end of disc number four. Please continue listening on disc number five. This is disc number five. It was an extraordinary opportunity for me, a major studio musical comedy about the last days of burlesque. Bud and Norman were two of the hottest guys around, and United Artists was the distributor of the James Bond films, the Beatles movies, Tom Jones, In the Heat of the Night, and Billy Wilder's the Apartment. They were regularly winning Academy Awards for Best Picture. Forget for the moment that I knew nothing 
about burlesque in the 20s, or how to direct a musical comedy. Forget that I had only the commercial failure of good times. Bud believed in me and convinced David Picker that with Norman producing, I'd bring something original and contemporary to an older subject. I was offered $100,000, which was huge at that time. It's still not chump change. Had I paid attention to Lass Fogel's original advice, I would have passed on Minsky's despite my friendship with Bud. I don't know whether it was his belief in me or my own hubris and desire to become a studio director that made me accept. Certainly, the hundred grand played a part, but it wasn't a good enough reason. The truth is, I hadn't yet learned how to control the machine. If it had been a subject close to my heart, a smaller, more personal film, it might have been possible. But I had chutzpah, the goodwill of others, and the recklessness of youth. Norman didn't write the script for Minsky's. It was written first by Sidney Michaels, then Arnold Schulman. When I read the script, I thought it was thin and superficial, not funny, but because it was Bud's project, I didn't want to dismiss it with extreme prejudice, as I had Peter Gunn. Instead, I told Norman the things that bothered me, and he listened patiently and tried to address them. Bud left for France, and Norman made a few cosmetic changes to the Minsky script. But the voices in my conscious mind told me not to do this picture. We started casting before I could even think about switching gears. Tony Curtis, the first actor we went to, agreed to do it. He was at the peak of his popularity and good looks, and I met with him to discuss the script at his home on Carrollwood Drive, a beautiful mansion that had once been the Keck Estate, one of the most impressive homes in the Holmby Hills area. Tony was bright, alert, self-taught, a street-smart kid from the Bronx. He had the largest collection of Joseph Cornell boxes, and he used to make his own boxed collages, which seemed, to my untrained eye, every bit as good as Cornell's. Tony was fun to be around. He told me he wanted to do Minsky's, but he felt the script was underwritten. You gotta tell Norman to put some meat on the bones, he said. Three weeks before Norman and I were to leave for New York to prepare for the film, Tony dropped out. He had an offer to play the Boston Strangler, which he felt would bring him more respect than another light comedy. He was right. Norman contacted the talent agencies, and in a short period of time, we had interest from two of the brightest stars on Broadway, Alan Alda, who was appearing in The Apple Tree, directed by Mike Nichols, and Joel Gray, who was giving his unforgettable performance as the MC in Cabaret. Alda and Gray agreed to do our film and were being fitted for costumes by our designer, Anna Hill Johnston. It was a real coup to land these guys. They were steeped in theatrical tradition, skilled at musical comedy. I looked forward to working with them. This euphoria lasted less than two weeks, when we got word that neither Alda nor Gray could get out of their plays. They had long-term contracts, and it looked like both shows were going to run for years. When we cast them, we were assured by their agents that they could give a month's notice to their producers, but that turned out to be bullshit. Jason Robards had worked with Bud and Norman in Divorce American style, and he became our lead, the burlesque straight man, Raymond Payne. The young dancer, whose story is at the center of the film, an Amish girl, was to be played by an up-and-coming Swedish starlet named Britt Eklund, recently married to Peter Sellers. For the third lead in the film, Chick, the comic, we cast Norman Wisdom, 
a British star of television, small films, and the music hall, who was little known outside of England and was ending a run as the lead in a musical comedy on Broadway called Walking Happy, a character called Professor Spatz, an old burlesque comic, was to act as a kind of tour guide to burlesque and to the Lower East Side in the 1920s, much as Maurice Chevalier did in Gigi. For this role, God blessed us with the great Bert Lahr. One of the rare pleasures of Minsky's was working with Bert. He had wonderful stories that spanned his more than 50 years in every medium of show business. He had been in the first American production of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot and played the entire run without knowing what he was saying or, quote, what the hell the play was about, unquote. The rest of the cast, all assembled by Norman Lear, was excellent. Forrest Tucker, Joseph Wiseman, Harry Andrews, Denham Elliott, and Elliot Gould in his second movie, as Billy Minsky, heir to Minsky's burlesque. Charles Strauss and Lee Adams, who had written Bye Bye Birdie and later It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman, wrote original music numbers for the film. Seeing it again recently, I found it charming, innocent, and touching in many ways. But Robards and Eklund are mismatched and have no chemistry as lovers. Norman Wisdom and the other actors are convincing, but Bert Lahr hardly registers. Before we finished even a third of the work he was to do, he fell ill, had to leave the production, and he died within the week. His absence left a hole in the film's emotional center. The zeitgeist was changing again, and a nostalgic piece of fluff about a bygone era, was out of step with the rise of independent cinema. Painful to remember, Minsky's was a disaster that set me back in every possible way. There were many problems in the making of it, but the biggest was my own ineptitude. I had researched the period, but I didn't really know how to convey the right tone. I was in over my head. The crew sensed this, from the first assistant director, Bert Harris, to choreographer Danny Daniels, to the director of photography, Andy Laszlo. A film crew can be like the sailors on the USS Kane, on the verge of mutiny. If they sense weakness in the captain, plenty of junior officers are always ready to step in and take over. Part of it is self-preservation. Key crew are in demand because of previous success, not failure. If a film goes down, it can take all hands with it. The burlesque sketches had to play broadly, each joke punched up to the max. I try to make them real, more contemporary. Huge mistake. How do you make this exchange sound real? Who is that lady I saw you with last night? That was no lady, that was my wife. Each time I set up a shot or talked to an actor about a scene, I was filled with uncertainty. Norman Lear was aware of the situation, and one day asked me if I would let our choreographer, Danny Daniels, stage the burlesque routines. I was relieved. I said, fine, but if I were you, Norman, I'd fire me. Is that what you want? he asked. I said, I know we're not on the same page, and it's your show. I'm no help to the actors, either. Why not? Norman asked. Because the characters are stereotypes, I said. Every line in the script is either a setup or a punchline. Clearly, Norman knew more about what we were doing than I did, as witness his subsequent career. Fantosi and I spoke by phone later that evening. I know you got problems, he said, concerned. David Picker doesn't like the dailies and wants to get rid of you. What about Lear, I asked. 
Lear hasn't agreed to that, Tony told me. A note of urgency then came into his voice. Don't quit, Fantosi insisted. These studio guys talk to each other every day. If you quit or get fired, it'll be professional suicide. If you pull this picture off, you can wind up with a multi-picture deal at UA. I didn't quit. I brought what I could to the picture, but I was the director in name only. Years later, I was surprised to hear Norman Lear's version of our sole collaboration. To my shock, he has no memory of the vitriol that marked our work together. He doesn't remember my telling him I hated the script. There were many scenes I thought you got exactly right, Norman said, and though he loves the film to this day, his anger at me kicked in after I turned in the rough cut and left the very next day for London to prepare to direct Harold Pinter's The Birthday Party. While in London, I gave an interview to a late-night talk show, saying I thought Minsky's was a terrible movie and that people needn't bother to see it. My anger at myself caused me to confess my own incompetence in a misguided attempt to expiate my guilt. This little caper was thoughtless and self-destructive. Two days after that interview, I got a call in London from Fantosi in Los Angeles. He said, David Picker called me, and he wants to kill you. There was anger in Tony's voice. What you said was inflammatory. Yorkin and Lear are furious, and I don't know how to solve this, Tony said. They thought I was trying to sabotage the film before it came out and Picker told Tony I'd never work at UA again. Tony had built my career from nothing, and now he was telling me he didn't think he could save it. Hearing his words was like receiving a death sentence. The final cut of Minsky's was Norman's, with assistance from our title designer, Pablo Ferro. Much as I'd like to absolve myself of blame for the film, I see my handiwork all over it, especially in the documentary approach to many of the scenes. As a complete change of pace, I began to prepare Pinter's The Birthday Party in London. It was the first film I really wanted to make, understood, and felt passionate about. But I embarked on it with a heavy heart. My career was in shambles. I was 31 years old and had burned a lot of bridges in Hollywood. London in the 1960s was a perfect antidote. The Beatles, the Stones, the angry young men of British theater and film, Chelsea, Carnaby Street, a culture more diverse than any I had ever experienced. And from a creative standpoint, the year I spent with Harold Pinter, on the screen adaptation of his first play was an awakening and a life-changing lesson in the art of creating serious, suspenseful drama. And now this is chapter four, which is called Silences. Tony Fantosi had arranged a meeting with Edgar Sherrick, former president of the ABC television network, who had recently gotten financing from the network to start his own film company, which he called Palomar Pictures. Palomar was trying to make low-budget films with young directors who wouldn't cost or spend a lot of money. The birthday party was alone on my wish list. The power and impact of Pinter's play and its potential as a film became my obsession. Fantosi had contacted the William Morris office in London, where Pinter lived, to find out if the rights were available. In a matter of days, I was on the phone, hearing Pinter's mellifluous baritone. He had no idea who the hell I was, or why I'd want to make a film of the birthday party, or if I had the wherewithal to do so. But his interest was piqued. Sherrick 
was willing to gamble on a difficult piece of material. Since he couldn't compete with the major studios for stars or material, he had a sail against the wind. Given Pinter's then-recent worldwide fame, Sherrick thought The Birthday Party, filmed in London on one set for a budget of a million dollars or less, would bring prestige to his company. Fantosi put him in touch with Harold's agent, and they worked out a tentative agreement. But Harold would only finalize it after we met and if we found common ground. I checked into an inexpensive hotel in Bayswater and took a short cab ride to number 7 Hanover Terrace, one in a long crescent of white six-story stucco houses designed by John Nash in the early 19th century in Regent's Park. Harold Pinter came to the door. I was warned that he tended to be intimidating, but I found him engaging, accessible, courteous, and modest. He was taller and more muscular than I had expected, with black curly hair and dark penetrating eyes. His expression used to morph from a wicked smile to a feigned wince of pain to a penetrating stare. While listening, he would cock his head to one side, occasionally smoking a cigarette. He was dressed in black trousers and a black silk shirt. He was five years older than me and had achieved international success. His house was elegantly furnished filled with good paintings, great books, and fresh flowers, so unlike the drab interiors of his plays. Harold's top-floor study was crammed with photographs of famous cricketers. Cricket was his passion. He had created a comfort zone from which he seldom ventured. His wife, Vivian Merchant, a distinguished stage and film actress, was usually at home when I visited. She and Harold had been married for 11 years. They met while both were struggling young actors, and he was working under the stage name David Barron. She always called him David around me, and when I asked why, he explained that his own name sounded too Jewish, given the undercurrent of anti-Semitism in the British theater during the 1950s. I personally thought David Barron sounded just as Jewish as Harold Pinter. They had a son, Daniel, then eight, a quiet, gifted child who frequently sought his father's advice while doing his homework. Vivian would have a pot of tea for us before we started work each day. They seemed a perfect family, though I did sense an underlying tension, which I attributed to my presence as an outsider, vying for Harold's attention. Vivian was Harold's muse, having appeared in a number of his plays and television shows, as well as the film Accident. The year we met, she had a great success in the movie Alfie, for which she received an Academy Award nomination, and she was appearing on stage as Lady Macbeth, in an unforgettable performance with Paul Schofield. She was quiet, sultry, and mysterious. I must have seemed as strange to Harold as his plays did to many theater goers. I was young, but with no interesting film credits, no theater experience, no impressive education, and I was American to boot. I had little to recommend me except Fantosi's assurances to Harold's agent that I was a brilliant director. I had two mediocre films, one of which was yet to be released, and an episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. Harold's fame was spreading quickly. He had shifted the paradigm of what was possible in serious drama. He blurred the line between truth and falsehood, in his characters. Pinteresque had entered the language to mean something challenging or difficult to decipher. 
I had the financial backing to make the film, but Harold didn't need money. He had become the most fascinating and celebrated playwright in the English language. The birthday party, the caretaker, and the homecoming, all of his plays were being performed around the world, and he had written the screenplays for critically acclaimed films like Accident, The Servant, The Pumpkin Eater, and The Quiller Memorandum. I was clearly, again, way over my head, but the birthday party had a profound effect on me from the first time I had seen it in San Francisco in 1962. The play is set in a shabby boarding house in a small town near Brighton in England. Meg, a slovenly middle-aged woman, runs the place. With the help of her husband, Petey, who has a part-time job setting up deck chairs on the beachfront. They have only one boarder, Stanley, a broken man who appears to have lost interest in life. A neighbor, Lulu, a would-be sexpot, occasionally comes to visit, but can make no connection with Stanley, while Meg treats him with compassion and something like love. She claims that today is his birthday, and she wants to give him a party, but he denies that it is and doesn't want a celebration. Into this seemingly banal environment, two men unexpectedly appear, Goldberg and McCann, looking for a room. They are well-dressed and slightly sinister, and we wonder why they would come to such a run-down hovel as this boarding house. The mood shifts abruptly with their arrival, and the tension begins to mount. With these six characters, Pinter creates an atmosphere of suspense and violence. Goldberg and McCann seem to have come to this out-of-the-way boarding house expressly to find Stanley, to interrogate and persecute him. But why? What has he done? Or is it a case of mistaken identity? Stanley is afraid. Something in his past has come back to haunt him. The party takes place against his wishes and becomes his worst nightmare. The next morning, a broken man. He's led away by Goldberg and McCann. Petey is powerless to help, and Meg only remembers how much fun she had at the party the night before. Now, the play can be viewed as a metaphor for the police state, for society's need to make the individual conform, the need of the strong to dominate the weak, the futility of resistance, the tyranny of religious persecution, and our inability to empathize with the suffering of others. It's all of this and more but it's best enjoyed for its surface pleasures, a disturbing comedy-drama about irrational fear and paranoia. It's not that Pinter's characters can't communicate. They communicate only too well, even though they use language to conceal their true feelings. When The Birthday Party was first produced in London in 1957, audiences and critics found it obscure, absurd, and bewildering. The Lord Chamberlain, in effect the censor of plays and movies in England, dismissed the play as, quote, insane and pointless, unquote. Pinter was a struggling actor and only 28 years old at the time. The birthday party was his second play, and it was a flop. He was broke newly married, with a baby to support, and living in a basement slum. The play closed after eight days, and only six people came to watch the final performance. This would have normally ended Pinter's career as a playwright, but a miracle occurred. Britain's most influential and respected theater critic, Harold Hobson, saw the play at the end of its run and wrote a review for the Sunday Times of London after the play had closed. Quote, I am willing to risk 
whatever reputation I have as a judge of plays by saying that Mr. Pinter, on the evidence of this work, possesses the most original, disturbing, and arresting talent in theatrical London. He has gotten hold of a primary fact of existence, that we live on the verge of disaster, unquote. Hobson's review rescued the play and Pinter's reputation. Harold and I met each day for a week at Hanover Terrace to discuss how to proceed. His responses to my ideas were precise and unequivocal. I had no desire to clarify what he had purposely kept ambiguous. I relished the pauses and the silences that conveyed dramatic effect as much as the language. I asked Harold how he came to write the play, and he told me that when he was working as an actor in the provinces, he once stayed in a boarding house run by a flirtatious, unkempt landlady. There was another boarder, an unemployed man who claimed to have played the piano professionally. These characters stayed in his memory and became Meg and Stanley. He started to write about them when unexpectedly, quote, two strangers knocked at the door, unquote. He didn't know who they were or why they came to this place, but he continued writing about them to find out. He wrote with no particular theme, no outline, and no explanation for the actions of his characters. Stanley was destined to be a victim, but Harold had no idea why. Everything he knew about the characters was in the play. He was influenced by Hemingway's short story, The Killers, in which two men come to a small town looking for a man they don't know to, quote, kill him for somebody else, unquote, to, quote, oblige a friend, unquote. Though our screenplay would be faithful to the play, Harold wanted three months to adapt it. He was inundated with scripts for radio, television, and the movies, along with directing plays of his own and others, and acting in all media. The cast he wanted was the one we eventually secured. Robert Shaw, who had starred in The Caretaker, on stage and in the film, would play Stanley. Considered one of England's best actors, Shaw was the villain in the James Bond film From Russia with Love, and he played Henry VIII in A Man for All Seasons. Patrick McGee worked with Pinter when they were both actors at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He was considered the ideal actor for Samuel Beckett's plays, and Harold admired and respected him. He would have no one else play McCann. Dandy Nichols, was a household name in Britain for the BBC series called Till Death Us Do Part, which later became the hit American television show All in the Family. She played Meg. For Goldberg, Harold wanted a man named Sidney Taffler. Taffler, a competent character actor, little known outside of England, gave one of the best performances ever seen in a Pinter film. We held auditions for the other two roles, casting Moultrie Kelsall as Petey and Helen Fraser as Lulu. Both had appeared only in small parts on British television, but Harold had an unerring sense of casting. Left on my own, I wouldn't have known to cast any of them, but to this day, I don't think our cast could have been improved. Sherrick decided to bring on two producers that he knew and trusted, Max Rosenberg and Milton Sabatsky, former New Yorkers who had produced several low-budget horror films in England. Happy to be associated with the birthday party, they hired a first-rate British crew. Dennis Koop, the director of photography, had been the camera operator on The Third Man, and is generally credited with that film's signature Dutch or tilted angles. As a director of photography, he lit the films This Sporting Life, King and Country, 
and Billy Lyre, all classics. The production designer was Ted Marshall, who designed Tom Jones, The Charge of the Light Brigade, and The Pumpkin Eater. The set was to be detailed and realistic, not abstract or symbolic. Ted, Harold, and I went to a little seaside town called Worthing, near Brighton, and chose the exterior of a boarding house. We filmed our exteriors there, but everything else was done on a set at Shepperton Studios. I loved the cast and crew and looked forward to working with them each day. It was the opposite of Minsky's. We rehearsed for ten days, and Harold would give me notes. I encouraged him to talk to the cast as well, and he advised them to say the lines, just say the lines, and not look for allegory. To quote him, there are no motivations for the behavior of these people that I'm aware of, and no way to determine whether they're speaking truth or telling lies. Just find the emphasis in the lines and the rhythm of the scene, he would suggest. One day, after a rehearsal in which the actors seemed to go slightly off script, Harold said, quote, If you want to do my lines, they have to be word for word. If one word is left out of a sentence or added, the rhythm of the scene falls apart. One of the actors asked him how to deal with the pauses. The pauses must absolutely be filled, was his answer. Though your character may not be speaking, there's always an unspoken language going on. One evening over drinks, Patrick McGee, who according to Harold knew more about the birthday party than he did, told me that two lines he remembered from the original production were cut out of the torrent of intimidating non-sequiturs with which Goldberg and McCann confront Stanley. These lines were Goldberg saying, who hammered the nails, and McCann saying, who drove in the screws. These lines were references to the crucifixion, and in the days when the Lord Chamberlain was the absolute authority over the British stage and screen, there could be no reference to the crown or to religion. McGee remembered these lines from the original production, and that evening I called Harold and asked him about them. His response was preceded by silence. Then Harold asked, What lines? I said, The two lines you cut for the Lord Chamberlain. There was a pause. Then Harold said, I don't remember cutting any lines. I said, Oh. Then there was a long pause. And then Harold said, Look, I have my original type script of the play upstairs in my study. If you hang on a minute, I'll go up and have a look. I held the phone to my ear for a long time while Harold walked up five flights. Finally, he picked up the phone extension in his office. He said, I have my type script in front of me. It's from 1957. I've opened it to the interrogation scene, and I don't see those lines. There was a pause. I said, damn. Another pause. Harold, you like those lines? Me. I love them. Harold, well, go ahead and put them in. Me. Are you serious? He was. Pinter known to be insistent about the precise use of his language, was telling me to put in two lines he claimed he hadn't written. Where did they come from? I have no idea. Robert Shaw was a brilliant actor, known for heroic roles and for classic villains. His own nature was as far from Stanley's as possible, but he had a deep understanding of Pinter's work and they were close friends. Off-screen, he was something of a jock and one of the most competitive men I've ever known. He claimed he was a good enough soccer player to have played for England. 
On our soundstage at Shepperton Studios, I had a hoop set up, and I used to shoot baskets between camera setups. One day, Shaw came over to watch me and said, Why are you playing a girl's game? I tossed him the ball and said, Here, you try it. He took shots from various distances and couldn't hit either the backboard or the rim. He angrily kicked the ball across the soundstage. Every morning I would come to the set an hour earlier than the crew to prepare the day's work with the cameraman, Dennis Koop. One day, arriving early, I heard the sound of a bouncing basketball. Bob Shaw. He'd come in early to practice so he could play me one-on-one. After a couple of weeks, we started to play, and I would inevitably beat him, fueling his frustration. He asked if I played ping-pong. Well, I was a boys' club champ at the age of 12. The next day, a ping-pong table arrived on the set. Bob fancied himself an exceptional ping-pong player, and we play a dozen or more games a day. He would win occasionally, but not enough to satisfy his appetite for victory. Like the rest of the cast, he was always prepared and enthusiastic. We shot the film in sequence from beginning to end, and I planned each setup in advance so that the film was made quickly and efficiently. Pinter was often on the set and looked at the dailies, His comments were always encouraging and perceptive, and he enjoyed the humor and subtleties of his own text. My staging was designed to keep the actors moving as much as possible and let the camera follow them. If a scene called for them to remain static, I would often slowly and imperceptibly move the camera closer or pull away. I tried to keep the camera work invisible, but there were times when I couldn't resist and opted for radical angles. During the blind man's buff game in the party scene when the lights go out, I cut to after images that occur when a room is suddenly plunged from light to darkness. When the lights were out, I went from color to black and white. As the blindfolded characters moved about the room, I had a camera attached to a gyroscopic mount on their backs, pointing over their shoulders on a wide-angle lens as they shuffled about in darkness. The cast and crew became like family to me. I was confident the film would cut smoothly, the performances were excellent, and I was thrilled to have directed actors of this caliber in material this good. Harold wanted to show it to Joe Losey, the director with whom he had made two brilliant films, Accident and The Servant. The day after Losey saw the film, Harold and I met at Hanover Terrace. Well, Joe thought the film was okay, Harold began. He had a few quibbles, but only one, well, rather urgent request. I asked Harold what that was. Quote, There's a shot into a mirror, when Meg crosses from the kitchen to an easy chair to resume knitting a sweater for Stanley, unquote. I remembered the shot and thought it was efficient camera logic. Harold said, It's the only mirror shot in the film, and Joe feels it sort of, well, quote, borrows his style, unquote. Losey was known for mirror shots and used several in each of his films. Joe asked me, Harold went on, if you would consider cutting it. I thought this was way out of line, but I was more disturbed that Harold would ask this of me. I told him I had no cover angles that brought Meg across the room. I also said it was wrong for Losey to suggest I recut my picture for some misperceived homage to him. Up until this moment, I treated Harold with deference and respect, but I couldn't satisfy this request. I wasn't about to destroy the film's continuity to mollify Joe Losey's ego. 
It was the only tense exchange I ever had with Pinter in a year of working with him. In the end, I made the film I wanted to make. Palomar released it, without fanfare, in a handful of theaters, and it didn't find an audience. I had hoped the film would bring redemption for Good Times and Minsky's. That wasn't to be. But The Birthday Party is a film of which I'm proud. The cast played it to perfection, with the exception of an occasional over-the-top directorial flourish. I think I captured Pinter's world. The time I spent with him and the many conversations we had were the most valuable and instructive of my career. My future prospects in Hollywood were, how shall I put this, uncertain. But I brought my mother out from Chicago to live with me in a rented house that was owned by Mickey Rooney on a quiet street in Beverly Hills. The house was small but charming, old brick and wood paneling, and my mother had never lived this well. She made friends in the neighborhood and continued nursing part-time as she still had the energy and the will to do that. I would drive her to Cedars sinai Hospital, where she worked, or I'd pick her up after work. She couldn't have been prouder of my accomplishments and that I had achieved enough to take care of her in this way. She was a calming influence, and it was because of her love and belief in me that I didn't lead a wasted life. I met regularly with Tony Fantosi, but I had no offers. Thirty-two years old and washed up. But Fantosi and the Morris office continued to believe in me. Not many people saw Minsky's or the birthday party, but two who did were Mart Crowley and Dominic Dunn. They were about to co-produce the film version of Crowley's provocative play, The Boys in the Band, for a new production company, Cinema Center Films, owned by CBS Television. Mart and Nick originally wanted the play's director, Robert Moore, to do the film, but Gordon Stulberg, head of Cinema Center, was reluctant to go with someone who'd never been behind a camera. They invited me to come to New York and see the play, but not before Mart called Harold Pinter, who gave me a glowing recommendation. They'd heard about my problems on Minsky's, so I wasn't a clear choice. But I had done three films and wouldn't ask for a lot of money. Possibly they thought the play was director-proof. It's difficult now to imagine the impact the play had in 1967. It was the first to deal openly with a gay lifestyle, and it was both hilarious and moving. Those who saw it, and there were over a thousand performances in its first incarnation, would never forget it. The important playwrights at the time, Tennessee Williams and Edward Albee, both gay, never dealt openly with gay subject matter. When Mart finished his play, he took it to Albee's producing partner, Richard Barr. Barr liked it, but Albee didn't. He told Mart the play was terrible and that it would set back gay liberation and bring more hatred and violence to gay people. Mart was devastated to have his work dismissed by his idol, but Richard Barr produced it in a small, off-Broadway theater. Albee thought it was a mistake, but agreed only on the condition that the play never be moved to a Broadway theater, which it easily could have after its first two weeks. It was an immediate sensation and the hottest ticket in New York, but to this day it has not been produced on Broadway. Each of the characters portrayed a different aspect of gay life, from the closeted to the campy, from the faithful to the promiscuous, from a male hooker to a schoolteacher, all guests at a birthday party. Yes, another one. The one so-called straight character 
is an uninvited and uncomfortable guest at the party. When I read Mart's screenplay, I was excited about its potential as a film. It was written out of passion, anger, and experience. Two weeks went by, during which other directors were interviewed. Then I got a call from Mart to return to New York. After a few drinks, we had a long talk. Mart told me about his life, being sexually abused as a child, growing up in Vicksburg, Mississippi, in a conservative Catholic family with two alcoholic parents, attending Catholic University in Washington, D.C., working in Hollywood as Natalie Wood's assistant. She's the one who gave him the time and the encouragement to write The Boys in the Band, his first play. He told me about his struggle to come to terms with being gay and how he had written the play in a state of depression, basing the characters on himself and people he knew. He was overwhelmed by the play's success, having known mostly failure in his creative endeavors up to then. Mart insisted we use the play's original cast, to which I happily agreed. They had come to embody their roles and worked well as an ensemble. We also agreed we'd have to achieve a realistic tone, and it would, of course, be an entirely new staging. He had ideas for opening up the film with a visual prologue in a handful of New York locations, but it needed the claustrophobia of a one-room set to retain its impact. The trick was to keep the film claustrophobic but cinematic. We never spoke about my own sexual preferences, but he knew I'd acquired a reputation for being difficult, and it was important to him that we communicate and work closely together. He was not going to be a passive screenwriter. Nick Dunn suggested we meet with Adam Hollander, a young director of photography who had recently come from Poland and studied at the famous film school in Lodz. Within three months, after Adam had shot a couple of documentaries and a few commercials, John Schlesinger hired him as director of photography on one of the best films of the late 1960s, Midnight Cowboy. The film was beautifully photographed and became the only X-rated film ever to win an Academy Award. Adam used handheld cameras, long lenses, and natural light to capture the world of a male hustler on 42nd Street. Nick set up a call for me with Schlesinger to talk about Hollander. He can be difficult, John said. How so, I asked. I think you should meet him and see how you feel about him, John suggested. We went on a location scout to the terrace of an Upper East Side apartment that belonged to the actress Tammy Grimes. She agreed to let us use it as the exterior of the apartment where Michael, played by Kenneth Nelson, the host of the party, lived. The interior would be built as a duplex on a soundstage, with walls that could be moved for angle changes and lights. Mart, Nick, and I loved the terrace. Adam Hollander didn't. Not enough room for lights, he said. I told him we'd be using it for only two brief scenes in broad daylight, and we could go with natural light. He looked at me as though I was demented. We went to a garage nearby, where Michael's friend Donald, played by Frederick Combs, would stop to gas up and check out the handsome young garage attendant. The garage was large and brightly lit, with fluorescence. Hollander thought it was impractical and would be better set on a stage. We went to Doubleday's Bookshop on Fifth Avenue, where we had three setups at most. Hollander said there was too much daylight streaming through the windows. The last location scout was to a hotel room in the Sherry Netherland Hotel, overlooking Central Park. I needed two shots there a silhouette toward the window of Alan, 
Michael's college buddy, played by Peter White, sitting on the edge of the bed, tearfully talking on the phone, and a reverse close-up of Alan to see his tears. Hollander shook his head. Wouldn't work. Why not? Where am I going to put my lights, he asked. That was it. We hired Arthur Ornitz, who'd photographed a thousand clowns, Requiem for a Heavyweight, and later Serpico and Death Wish. Art was fast, and he shot all the locations with no fuss. He made it possible to shoot a wide array of angles and imperceptibly change moods as day evolved into night. I rehearsed for two weeks and encouraged the cast to rediscover their characters. At first they resisted. They had done the play for a year. Words they had learned long ago, I told them to forget, rethink, and rediscover. They found subtleties to their performances that weren't possible on stage and I was able to emphasize relationships with the placement of the camera. The birthday party had sharpened my sense of how to capture a scene without allowing the camera to be intrusive. Mart wrote a scene that was off stage in the play. Hank, the schoolteacher, played by Larry Luckinbill, and Larry, his lover, played by Keith Prentice, leave the party when it swerves drunkenly out of control, and they go up to a guest bedroom where we see them kiss passionately. It would undoubtedly have been the first time such a scene was portrayed in a mainstream film. Luck and Bill and Prentice reluctantly agreed to do it. But then, after objections from their agents, they refused. Such a scene would ruin their careers, they were told. Mart and I talked to them for weeks as their anxieties grew, along with their resolve not to do the scene. As we were about to reach the end of the schedule, they realized the scene's importance and its value as a statement about their character's commitment. They were putting their trust in me to shoot the scene sensitively, and I tried to approach it as just another shot. Much later, in the cutting room, we felt we didn't need it, that it would only sensationalize the moment. In retrospect, I think we should have kept it. During pre-production, Mart and I would socialize together. He took me to the Pines section of Fire Island, a Long Island beach community that was an all-gay enclave, and I was able to meet the prototypes of his characters. There, everyone was without inhibitions, and parties went on all weekend, day and night. As a straight man in a gay world, I got a sense of what it was like to be an outsider. I approached Mart's screenplay as a love story, with humor and pathos. I saw his characters as people, not types and I tried to reflect their pain at having to hide their true natures from the prejudices of family, friends, and colleagues. The Boys in the Band is a compassionate, insightful work, and I tried to understate its deeper social implications. The film was widely publicized, but the reviews were mixed and the box office disappointing. A great many people loved it, and to this day, I hear from people on whom it had a profoundly liberating effect. Today, it's generally regarded as a landmark film. I say this in all modesty because I believe its power lies in Mart's script and the brilliant performances by the entire cast, which went virtually unrecognized at the time. Three members of the cast, only three of the original nine, Larry Luckinbill, Peter White, and Reuben Green, are still alive. I can still watch the film with pleasure, but at the time, 
It was another box office failure. Four in a row. And now we come to part two of the book, the 1970s. This is chapter five, which I call Popeye and Cloudy. In 1913, Cecil B. DeMille was looking for a place to shoot a western. It was called the Squaw Man. He was living in New York City, so he boarded a train heading west and got off at Flagstaff, Arizona. Surprisingly, the weather was bad there. He sent a telegram to his partners back east, Jesse Lasky and Sam Goldfish, who later changed his name to Goldwyn. Quote, Flagstaff no good. Want authority to rent barn for $75 a month in place called Hollywood, unquote. The yellow barn was at Selma and Vine Streets and was still being used for horses. The Squaw Man was released a year later and is one of the first full-length films made in Hollywood. It was certainly the first most successful. In 1926, the barn was moved to the United Studios on Marathon and Van Ness Streets which soon became the home of Paramount Pictures. If the weather in Flagstaff hadn't been bad, if the barn in Hollywood hadn't been for rent, if the Squaw Man had not been a hit, there wouldn't have been a Hollywood for movies. In later years, the old weather-beaten barn in which the Squaw Man was photographed was converted into a gymnasium on the Paramount lot, equipped with weights, Mats, rings, chin-up bars, and most important, the best steam room in Los Angeles. From the time of its reincarnation as the Paramount Gym, the man who ran it was a short, bald, good-natured fellow named Orlando Perry. Or Perry Orlando, not even he was sure which one was correct. I came to know Perry and his gym when I was directing Good Times on the Paramount lot. I remained a regular for 16 years until the old barn was designated a landmark, moved off the lot, and relocated opposite the Hollywood Bowl, where it's now the Hollywood Heritage Museum. Perry's massages were wonderful, and his clients included Clark Gable, Steve McQueen, William Holden, and many other male stars in Hollywood. Until the mid-1970s, women weren't allowed. You could lift weights, take a steam, then fall into a deep sleep on Perry's old massage table. Before you knew it, you'd wake up refreshed and invigorated. Perry's friend, Johnny Indrasano, a former light heavyweight boxing contender, used to hang around the gym and tell great boxing stories. Johnny had over 60 professional fights, and when his boxing days were over, he went on to stage the fight scenes for various films. He did that great bar fight in Shane and the fight on the ranch between Alan Ladd and Van Heflin in that same picture. He also staged the fight in the diner that ends the movie Giant. Johnny taught me how to use the punching bags, and I would spar with him two or three times a week for years. I first met Phil D'Antoni in the steam room at Paramount. Phil had recently produced his first feature film, Bullet, after packaging and producing television specials. He had a quick smile and a Bronx accent. He was even-tempered, but he never let you forget he was Sicilian. The Morris office represented us both, and Fantosi thought we would hit it off. He sent him my documentaries, and Phil had seen my four features. He thought I had promise, and he felt that we could work together. We had similar interests and sensibilities. We liked and disliked the same movies. I thought Bullet was one of the best films of my generation. One afternoon, Phil told me about a book he optioned by Robin Moore, author of The Green Berets. 
The book was nonfiction and told the story of the largest heroin bust in the United States. It was called The French Connection, and it focused on the exploits of two colorful New York City detectives, Eddie Egan and Sonny Grasso. I couldn't get through it. It seemed dry and procedural on the page. And it wasn't until I flew to New York with Phil and met Egan and Grasso that I was able to see a movie in their story. Egan and Grasso were fascinating. They told me about the offhand manner in which they stumbled onto the French Connection case while off-duty in a nightclub. They were opposite sides of the same coin. Egan was a big guy with curly red hair under a pork pie hat that he sometimes wore backward. His nickname was Popeye. Grasso was dark, wiry, and serious, a detail man. He was called Cloudy. Egan was intentionally funny. Grasso had a sense of humor as well, and they both had total recall about their most famous case. They took full credit for the case, even though there were dozens of New York City detectives and members of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which is now defunct, involved. When I met them, they were no longer partners. Eddie was in the 81st Precinct in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Sonny in the 28th in Harlem, two of the most dangerous precincts in New York. They were admired by other street cops, but were resented by their supervisors and department heads for the publicity they received. They would remain friends for life, though Eddie's ended in 1995 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he died of cancer. Eddie was loud and boastful, while Sonny was low-key and totally supportive of his partner. To Sonny, Eddie was the man, the best street cop ever to put on a badge. But he often had to hold him in check on the job. Eddie used to play games with a suspect, often asking unanswerable questions to throw the suspect off balance like, did you ever pick your feet in Poughkeepsie? While Sonny would confront the suspect with the facts. Like, we saw you sell that guy a nickel bag. Together, they led the Narcotics Bureau in collars. But often, quote, the perp, unquote, would be back on the street that afternoon or the next day. And the beat went on. American law enforcement had declared a war on drugs. But from what I saw in the early 1970s at the side of two of New York's finest, the war was already lost. Dealers were flourishing across the country, and generations of young people were stoned. There are many origin stories of the French Connection case. The official one was Robin Moore's, largely provided by Egan and Grasso, and is the one on which we base the film. This version has been disputed over the years and revised by Moore himself in a later book called Mafia Wife. Of course, the unvarnished truth is far more complex, involving a number of countries and a ten-month time frame. Our film was never intended to be a documentary, but an impression of that period. But to this day, Sonny says the film is 90% accurate. Now here's Egan and Grasso's version. On a late October night in 1961, after two straight days on duty, they clocked out of the 1st Precinct in Lower Manhattan, headquarters of the Narcotics Bureau. Eddie, Popeye, coerced Sonny, Cloudy, to join him for a nightcap at the Copacabana in Midtown, where Eddie was a regular and dated the hat check girl. The headliner that night was Joe E. Lewis. There, they observed a party of known criminals and junk connections in the company of wives and girlfriends at a corner table where a young guy they couldn't identify was picking up tabs and, quote, 
spreading cash around like the Russians were in Jersey, unquote. On a hunch, Eddie persuaded Sonny to, quote, give the big spender a tail, just for fun, unquote. The big spender and the blonde in the car with him turned out to be Pasquale Patsy Fuca and his wife Barbara. Patsy was a small-time hood with mafia connections who had been arrested for armed robbery in an attempt to hold up Tiffany's on Fifth Avenue. He was also suspected of a contract killing, but the investigating officers didn't have enough to indict him. Barbara, 19 years old, had been arrested for shoplifting and drew a suspended sentence. Patsy's uncle was Angelo Tuminaro, a mafia don who had murdered his way to the top and was suspected of controlling the heroin traffic from Europe and the Middle East into the United States. Patsy and Barbara left the Copa at 2 a.m. and got into a late model Oldsmobile. The two detectives followed at a safe distance in an unmarked maroon Corvair. Patsy made several stops along the way, in and around Little Italy. He was met by various men who appeared briefly out of the shadows. They would talk briefly, Patsy would hand them each a small package, and then they would drive to another location. Same routine continued until 5 o'clock on a Sunday morning, when the Olds stopped under the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Patsy and Barbara got out, locked the car, and walked to a 1947 Dodge parked nearby, and then they took off again. This time, they drove only a few blocks into Brooklyn, where they parked in front of a small candy store and luncheonette called Barbara's. They went inside, turned on the lights, and started to compile sections of the Sunday morning papers. At 7 a.m., the luncheonette opened for business. What the hell was going on? A goomba throwing money around like it was paper in an expensive nightclub who turns out to be the owner of a luncheonette in Brooklyn? After surveilling Patsy for four months on their own time, Egan and Grasso got permission to wiretap Patsy's home and store. Known criminal characters were turning up and packages were being delivered to the luncheonette by UPS. At first, their target was Patsy's uncle, Angie Tuminaro, whose whereabouts were unknown. Ed Carey, chief of the City Narcotics Bureau, informed George Gaffney, his counterpart at the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, about the surveillance and Gaffney assigned Special Agent Frank Waters to accompany Egan and Grasso. From the outset, there was friction between the feds and the city cops, personal as well as turf. The tale on Patsy and Barbara continued for two more months as the net began to widen. Late in 1961, a visitor arrived in New York from France on an ocean liner the USS United States. The visitor was Jacques Angelvan, a popular French television star, host of a daily program called Paris Club. In Paris, Angelvan had purchased a 1960 Invicta. He brought the Buick to New York at the request of a friend and benefactor named Francois Scaglia, a Corsican, age 34. Scaglia was known in France as the executioner, having organized several contract killings. He was also big in the Marseille heroin trade, and when he heard his friend Angelvan was going to New York, he asked him for a favor. Take the Buick with you. Angelvan later denied knowledge of the cargo that was embedded in the rocker panels of the Buick. 112 pounds of uncut heroin. Street value in America, 
$32 million. While these plans were underway, Sonny and Eddie heard from informants that there was a heroin drought, but a big shipment was coming in from overseas. The shipment was accompanied to Montreal and eventually New York by Scaglia and his partner, a Frenchman named Jean Jehan, boss of the world's largest heroin network and known as the Giant. The tale on Patsy Fuca eventually led Egan, Grasso, and Waters to Jehan, who they called Frog One, to Scaglia, Frog Two, and to Angie Tumanaro. In all, over 300 state, federal, and international detectives were involved, as well as other criminal conspirators. But taking Robin Moore's lead, we focused on Egan and Grasso, Jahan and Scaglia, with Waters reduced to a minor role. The case followed a circuitous path. The impromptu nightcap at the Copa, the unexpected sighting of Patsy Fuca, the hunch that led to his surveillance, the arrests of the minor players, and the escape from justice of all the big shots. Here was a canvas broader than anything I'd ever been involved with, from Marseille to Brooklyn and all over New York City. The underlying theme was the thin line between the policeman and the criminal. Jahan, the dapper gourmet, with a daughter in a convent and a loving young wife. Scaglia, the ice man, who could kill without emotion. Patsy, the lowlife dealer, with dreams of a score that would put him in the big time. Sonny Grasso, a confirmed bachelor, subservient to his partner, whom he idolized, but who was lethal in the street. Eddie, the ladies' man a braggart and a tough guy, obsessive, never without his pork pie hat or a policeman's thirty-eight special strapped to his ankle. Popeye and Cloudy. Though they were assigned to different precincts when we met, they arranged to work together in their off time so I could experience their dynamic firsthand. For weeks, without permission from their chiefs, Eddie and Sonny took me on the job, either to the 28th or 81st precinct. They took me to bars and shooting galleries in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant, where they were certain to find users and dealers. One night, we broke into an apartment in Harlem where a family of 12, from young children to grandmothers, was lying around a living room floor with needles in their arms. This is the end of disc number five. Please continue listening on disc number six. This is disc number six. One night, we broke into an apartment in Harlem where a family of 12 from young children to grandmothers, was lying around a living room floor with needles in their arms. My God, I said to Sonny, this is ten minutes from where I live. At the time, I was renting an apartment at 86th Street and Park Avenue on the east side of Manhattan. Similar scenes were happening across the city and the country. Every day we'd go to African-American bars where Popeye would feel along the ledge under the bar grabbing magnets filled with drugs that he would toss into a cocktail shaker, mixing them with stale beer. Cloudy would grab the perps and lock them in a phone booth near the entrance to the bar. I saw them do this at least a dozen times before I recreated it on film. As we entered the bars, Eddie would take out his thirty-eight special and hand it to me. Cover the back, he used to say to me, under his breath. I'd be standing there with a lethal weapon which I'd never fired, hoping the perps wouldn't bolt for the back door. 
Eddie and Sonny needed to know that if necessary, I had their backs. They take control of at least 50 of the baddest dudes I had ever seen. Everyone had a record. Everyone was wrong, as Eddie would say. I went on stakeouts and busts until I knew what they would say and do in every situation. While on the job or on a lunch break, they'd reveal more details of the French Connection case and the personalities of the other players. D'Antoni and I had meetings at the major studios. We had no script, but we could talk through the details of the story, and we added a chase scene. There was no interest. National General was a small company, a kind of hobby for its three owners, who were millionaire investors and sportsmen in their day jobs. The operating partner was Irv Levin, who owned the Boston Celtics, and later the San Diego Clippers basketball teams. Sam Schulman, who owned the Seattle Supersonics, and Eugene Klein, who owned the San Diego Chargers football team. They liked the idea of the French Connection, though there was no script and no star attached, and they trusted D'Antoni because of Bullet. I, on the other hand, was a question mark, quote, too soft, too artsy-fartsy, unquote, was the opinion of their head of production, Dan Pelaire. But D'Antoni believed in me, and he held out, even when they threatened to pull the plug on the picture if I was the director. Phil convinced National General to let us commission a screenplay. Alex Jacobs had written Point Blank, a vengeance film that was becoming a cult favorite. We gave him Robin Moore's book and our take on the story, emphasizing the chemistry between the two detectives. Alex worked for several weeks and produced a script that neither Phil nor I liked. We turned it into National General and got the bad news from Dan Pelaire. They were putting the project in turnaround. There are pictures that go into turnaround for ten or more years before they ever get made, or they never get made at all. Turnaround means that if another studio decided to make the picture, they'd have to reimburse National General for the money they had initially invested in the script. We schlepped the French connection around for two years without a script we believed in. We took it to every studio, and we were rejected by all of them. We pitched it to the head of MGM, a distinguished white-haired gentleman named Bob O'Brien. He was cordial, but had no interest in what we were talking about. After the meeting, which we knew would be another pass, Phil and I left the MGM lot and stopped at a soft drink stand that was across the street. It was a hot summer afternoon, and Phil had to sit down. He had been smoking three packs a day and was short of breath. No studio believed I had the skills to deliver an action picture, especially one without a great script. I looked at Phil and felt his pain. I told him I would walk away and he could find another director who was acceptable to the studios. He insisted we were partners and would continue to be. We had to believe in ourselves and in the material because we had nothing else to believe in. Phil and I continued to meet, but less frequently. We were each trying to get something else going. He gave me the galleys of a novel he had just read called Shaft, about a black private detective, and it had a feel for the mean streets of New York. It was a first novel by a foreign news editor on the New York Times named Ernest Tidyman who wanted to write screenplays and quickly accepted our offer to do a draft of the French Connection for $5,000. We gave him the previous drafts, along with Robin Moore's book, and we met with him to lay out a structure and describe our experiences with Egan and Grasso. He produced a workmanlike script in less than a month. 
The Morris office sent the new drafts to all the studios, again. And again, they all passed. Two years had gone by since I finished Boys in the Band, and I hadn't shot a frame of film. I was asleep one winter morning in New York when the phone rang. It was about four o'clock in the morning. Ed Gross, my business manager. He told me my mother had died the day before. She was walking on Walden Drive in Beverly Hills and dropped dead of a heart attack. I asked Ed to arrange to have her buried. No funeral service. I stayed awake crying that morning, remembering all my mother meant to me and how much I loved and valued her. She had sacrificed her life for me. She was in her early sixties when she died. Whatever goodness resides in me comes from her. And whenever I've strayed, I know that somewhere she disapproves, but loves me nonetheless. That morning it was snowing in New York. I booked a flight to Los Angeles and got to the airport early. Standing alongside a fence, watching the planes land and take off, was strangely comforting, but I was filled with anxiety. When I got to the Beverly Hills rented house, I arranged with Ed Gross to donate my mother's clothes to the poor, and I packed my own things and put them into storage. I walked around the little house for the last time and tried not to lose myself in memories. One day, after I had signed up for unemployment benefits for the second time in my life, a man named Larry Auerbach called. Larry was Phil D'Antoni's agent at the Morris office, and he never gave up on the French connection or us, though it seemed by then like a lost cause. Larry said that Dick Zanuck, head of 20th Century Fox, who'd previously passed on the film, wanted to meet with us. Phil and I went to Zanuck's enormous office on the Fox lot, which once belonged to his father, Daryl, one of the storied Hollywood producers and studio heads. Fellas, Dick said, I've got a million and a half dollars hidden away in my budget for the rest of the year. I'm on my way out. They're going to fire me. But I've got a hunch about that French Connection script. Can you guys make it for a million and a half dollars? Our own budget estimate was double that. Phil silenced me with a kick to the leg, and he said, Sure, I don't see why not. How soon can you start? Zanuck asked. Phil jumped in again, right away. Zanuck asked, Who do you see in it? What about Paul Newman? Phil said. Zanuck laughed. You're never going to get Paul Newman. He makes half a million a picture, which is a third of your budget. Who else? I'll tell you who I think would be great, I offered. Jackie Gleason. He's a black Irishman, like Eddie Egan. He's a great actor. Dick Zanuck cut me off. I'll never make another picture with Jackie Gleason as long as I'm at this studio. He was angry. Did you ever see Gigo? It was the worst disaster in the history of Fox. A silent movie about a clown. Can you believe it? And I let him make it. He shook his head. No, no Jackie Gleason. No way. I then suggested a new actor that Phil and I had briefly discussed, Peter Boyle, who had just appeared as a murderous bigot in a successful independent film, his first, called Joe. Silence. Zanuck's expression didn't change, but he slowly nodded. You know, that's not a bad idea, he said. We met with Boyle. He was tall, heavy, broad-shouldered, with piercing black eyes and a bald head with a fringe. He had a threatening appearance, though he was actually kind and funny. 
He was caught up in sudden success, playing an unlikable character, but his performance was powerful, original, and real. We told him our story and gave him Ernest Tidyman's script. Two days later, he called us back. I appreciate your interest in me, he said, but I don't want to do characters like this anymore. I'd like to do a romantic comedy next. He must have looked in the mirror and seen Cary Grant. Years later, Mel Brooks saw in him young Frankenstein. But Zanuck was completely on board. We had a go picture after two years of no interest. Listen, Zanuck said, you don't need a star for this. Stop thinking about stars. You just need a good actor. It's better for the picture if he's unknown and can inhabit the character. You don't need a name. I don't want names, and you can't afford them. No studio head would say something like this today. Would you go with a guy who's never acted before, but is totally right for this character? I asked him. Who? Have you ever heard of a newspaper columnist in New York named Jimmy Breslin? Zanuck smiled. You think he can act? I don't know, I said, but he'd understand what we're trying to do, and he's a fascinating guy. Dick actually thought it was an interesting idea. Why don't you go back to New York and test him, he suggested. We set up offices at the Fox Building on the west side of Manhattan. Phil brought Egan and Grasso on as consultants. We started to put together a crew, and one of the first people we hired was a casting director recommended by Phil. Bob Weiner was not exactly a casting director. He was a theater and film reviewer for the Village Voice magazine, opinionated to the point of abrasiveness, but aware of every new actor on the scene. Weiner was one of the earliest reviewers to praise Whoopi Goldberg. He saved every playbill from every play he'd ever seen. He lived in a dark, one-room apartment on West 57th Street that was stocked floor to ceiling with old newspapers and magazines. These were his research materials. In a short time, he brought me three little-known actors, Alan Weeks, Tony Lobianco, and Roy Scheider. Scheider was an underemployed actor, mostly in off-Broadway plays. He had a small role in the film called Clute, which hadn't come out yet. The second he walked into my office, I knew he would be perfect for Grasso. He was dark, lean, good-looking, and smart. What are you doing now, Roy? I asked him. I'm in an off-Broadway play, The Balcony, by Jean Genet, he answered. What sort of part do you play, I asked him. I play a cigar-smoking nun, he said. Seriously? He nodded. Great, I said. You're hired. He thought I was putting him on. I said, you're hired. You're going to play Sonny Grasso. Don't you want me to read, he asked. I saw no point in reading actors. If I wasn't already familiar with their work, I went by looks, demeanor, intelligence, and my own gut feeling. In the past, I'd read actors and found they could often read, but they couldn't play the character or the other way around. Some actors don't come alive until the cameras start rolling and are terrible at table readings or auditions. I've always felt the audition process puts too much pressure on an actor, and I've learned to trust my instincts. That's what a director has to do on every aspect of a film. The script, the cast, the crew, the locations. You have to listen to that inner voice that says, go, or no. We hired Scheider, and I immediately put him together with Grasso to get some street cred. I met Jimmy Breslin at Gallagher's Steakhouse on the west side near the theater district. The large wood-paneled room was smoky and crowded, with an elliptical bar and drawings of celebrities on the walls. Gallagher's 
was one of Jimmy's many watering holes, and I had drinks with him there many times. He was a quintessential New York character and a terrific journalist. We had a lot to drink that night, and we were joined by one of Jimmy's closest friends and cronies from Queens, Fat Thomas, who was soon to become an important part of the French Connection team. Fat had been arrested for bookmaking 52 times with only one conviction. He was also the agent for New York's premier arsonist, who Jimmy used to refer to in his columns as Marvin the Torch. Jimmy wrote about the exploits of Fat, whose real name was Thomas Rand, and Marvin, whose real name is still a secret, in his thrice-weekly column in the old New York Herald Tribune. Fat and I became good friends. He was a jovial street guy, 425 pounds, about six foot three, prematurely gray and nearsighted. Nobody knew New York better than Fat, and he had connections in every corner of the city. It took a lot of Jack Daniels for me to convince Jimmy to test for the lead in the movie. What are you, crazy, he said. I ain't no actor, and I don't like cops. You put me in that movie as a cop, they'll kill both of us. Jimmy, I said, I think you can do this. His ego was always near the surface. I ain't going to give up my day job, he insisted. You won't have to, I said. You can write your columns from the set and on your days off. You're nuts, he said. Can't you find some actor? Fat Thomas chimed in, possibly because he sensed something in it for himself. Go ahead, Brez. What do you got to lose? Breslin slapped him on the back. You fat fuck yous. We laughed. I didn't know if Breslin could pull it off, but he had the look, the personality, and an understanding of the cop mentality. He also had the Irish gift of gab. Given that and our friendship, I thought I could pull it out of him, even though he had no technique as an actor. I worked with him for a week, improvising scenes between him, Scheider, and Alan Weeks. On Monday, Jimmy was brilliant, inventing the dialogue of a cop harassing a suspect some of which made it into the final film. On Tuesday, he was confused and frustrated, forgetting what he had done the day before. On Wednesday, he showed up late, having had a few drinks. During a lunch break at a diner in East Harlem, Egan and Grasso stopped by to check out what was to them a disturbing rumor, that we were rehearsing with Breslin, the cop-hater, to play Egan. On Thursday, Breslin didn't show up and didn't call. 